So let's assume we have 2000 records of personal data and we want to sort them by the personal number in the first column. On a PC that's no problem. We may use something like the dos sort command or load it into a spreadsheet and all this only takes a fraction of a second. This is not only the result of much processing power but also the result of endless core memory or RAM. A current PC may have left 8GB for data, 2000 punch cards would hold 160,000 characters, the 1401 may have left only 8KB for data. A graph may look like this, seems like something is missing here but that's only due to the scaling. If we would change the scale so that we could see the upper two bars, the lower bar would have a length of about 4 kilometers. It's no problem to hold the data of 2000 cards in a PC RAM and do a quick sort or whatever, but in the 60s the core memory of a 1401 would only be a fraction of the size of the data to be sorted. Of course this is still relevant today if you want to sort some bigger database that exceeds the size of a normal server RAM, so we need some more sophisticated algorithms. The trick is to use external data storage, in our case magnetic tapes. Four drives is an ideal number for the standard algorithm. I won't go into details about the algorithm, there's many information available, for example at Wikipedia. The so 1401 sorts the records in those chunks, distributing them between the drives. This happens until all records are processed. In the last one all records get concentrated onto one tape again, the output tape. For demonstration I've prepared a tape with some data. I only filled it with about 270 records, not the 2000 shown initially, just to save time because the sort duration depends on how many alternating chunk sorts are needed, which again is a function of the amount of records. I've also prepared a small program which can list tape records onto the printer. I'll use it now to show you the unsorted data. Load, show the printout and hit start and here you can see the unsorted data. You can get the object deck, that means the cards with a machine program, from different collections. I got mine from the Computer History Museum's restoration site and I imported it into the simulation. When importing, keep in mind that those files are often in ZimH format. The SORT7 program is a very powerful tool, which offers some more advanced features and to tell it what to do exactly it needs some parameters, just like any modern program too. For those machines of course it was a common procedure to provide the program parameters by adding additional punch cards. There's a whole bunch of options described in the SORT7 manual. Column 1 to 6, where we tell which tape drives we are going to use. Drive 1 and 2 for the first group, 3 and 4 for the second group. Our data occupies one wheel, 9 to 12 tells the record size, in our case 80 characters. 13 to 15 is a so called record blocking factor. My input data file doesn't use blocking, so we punch a 001. Same for the blocking factor of the output tape. Column 19, what should happen with unreadable blocks. Column 20 for the tape density. Column 21 to 26 is information about the so-called tape headers. Our tapes don't use tape headers, so we leave all fields empty. 
Column 27 is the core size. The next punches tell the program by which columns to sort. It's possible to use more than one field for sorting. First we have to state an overview of all sort fields, so we will use a total of one field with a total number of six characters. And in detail we want to sort by the ID number in column 1 to 6. So the location of the sort field is column 1 and the length of the sort field is 6 characters. We don't need the rest, nevertheless there's one field worth mentioning, column 57. The space here states that we use fixed record length. This means all records have the same length. First we need to add the control card with the parameters to the program deck. In this case the card has to be inserted between card 244 and 245. We can now take the complete stack and load it into the computer. Also it's convenient to activate switch D. Normally the tape gets overwritten, but by using switch D the system holds and you may exchange it with an unused tape. Here you can see now that the system can sort 19 records at once in memory.
sometimes programs and counter error conditions. This was often done by simply halting and then documenting which error is related to this halt address. I simulated an error here by configuring a wrong record length on the control card, stating 60 characters on the card while having 80 characters on the tape. It halted, but it doesn't provide a printed error message in this case, but by looking at the instruction register, you may find an entry in the program documentation. So in this case, let's look at the address and let's look if we can find an entry in this table. It's telling us that we didn't configure variable length records. The text is a bit misleading, but means that since we configured fixed length records, the record length on the card has to fit the record length on the tape. Additionally, the tape states a sequence number. This number references the exact line in the source code listing, where we may further analyze any possible problem if necessary. I just pretended that the system has only 8K of core memory. This forces a sort program to only sort small chunks, in our specific case 19 records at once. If I had configured the full core size of 16K, the chunk size could have been 49 records. This would have allowed the system to sort many more records in core, but it also would have caused it to use the tape drives much less frequently, which simply would have been much more boring, since the most interesting action of mainframes happens with the rotating tape wheels. Many professional software packages allow so-called user exits, those are documented locations in the software where one can integrate additional routines to adapt the software to individual requirements without changing the software itself. The documentation lists umpteen possible user exits for any possible occasion over several pages. This is partly interesting because I found many cards in the Sort7 object deck which didn't have a reference to the source code. So I first thought those were user exits of the company that used exactly this card deck in the past, before someone saved it for us. I have created a deck where I removed all those strange cards. I didn't want to screw up my data and it worked indeed flawlessly. But also this complete deck with all those extra cards worked in the same way. Having a look at the additional cards, it seems that those aren't user programmed routines because they don't use the user exit point. Meanwhile, I think that those are patch cards which were used to fix bugs. At least for the sort in this video, they don't make any difference. <laughs> 